American Chestnut Foundation, or TACF for short, was formed to save the tree and restore what was lost. Today, this program is one of the most ambitious ecological restoration programs in the world. We share an appreciation of trees and forests with another community that plays a similar and complementary role with farmers who are growing chestnuts commercially for culinary purposes. These farmers are a small but very dedicated group bringing chestnuts back to our local markets. Nationally, they comprise about a thousand farms producing chestnuts on, about, on only about 4,000 acres. In fact, there's so few that, they, that, the, that the USDA does not barely tracks what goes on in this community. Their farms are mostly in Michigan, Florida, California, Oregon, and Virginia. And they're less than five are in Pennsylvania and New Jersey. To look at how chestnut farmers organize and market their products, we invited an expert who understands the industry from the ground up, all the way to the final, from the ground up, all the way to the final point of sale to consumers. Our guest, Roger Blackwell, happens to be president of three different chestnut related enterprises. He's president of Chestnut Growers, Inc., LLC, a cooperative, and of a farm, New Era Chestnuts. And he's president of the Chestnut Growers of America, a national nonprofit that promotes chestnuts, supports research and development, and disseminates information to growers. Roger, welcome to Chestnut Week. Nice to be here, Jim. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. Roger, you. um, you're in Michigan, uh, which is the number one state for chestnut farms. Uh, interestingly enough, it's, it wasn't really very little of it was in the original range of the American chestnut. That's true. And you're also in a state where there's walnuts, hazelnuts, hickory nuts, pecans, and many other nuts. And your state is known as the cherry capital of the world and uh, produces many other fruits with that climate, uh, that, that lake climate, lake effect. Yes. Climate. So how did you become involved in chestnuts? Well, basically, um, back in the 80s, um, my father-in-law got excited about chestnuts, and it kind of carried on over to me um, and his son also, and uh, we got the bug and, and uh, read a lot about chestnuts and learned about it was a, it was a very unique food in that it's a, it's a complex carbohydrate. And uh, it has protein, it has vitamin A, vitamin C, vitamin E, and it's it's just a, uh, a a unique nut. It's really not a nut in the way they describe it. You know, a chestnut. It's more it's more like a fruit, and uh, actually they call it the grain that grows on trees because ultimately you can uh, make uh, chestnut flour uh, and many other products from from uh, chestnut. So it's it's uh, and that why I say it's more like a fruit, it's 50% water. I mean, it's not like a typical nut, like a walnut or a pecan or something like that. It's, it's, a, it's an unusual, um, unique food. And uh, you could actually live on chestnuts. Um, the Italians during the uh, World War I and World War II, uh, they survived on chestnuts. Uh, way back in Roman days, the Roman army marched on chestnuts. They planted trees wherever they marched and they also made a, made a uh, kind of a, a flatbread and they used that as a food source when they're marching all around to the different countries in, in Europe and such. So uh, it's got a lot of history. And uh, unfortunately, the American chestnut was a, was a, a <laughs> well, I guess if we lived around uh, 1898, we would have saw 3.7 billion trees growing all along the Appalachian mountain range. And that was quite, you know, that was a food source, it was a lumber source uh, for people, settlers during that time. So um, we've got a lot of history about chestnuts in the United States. And, and uh, I don't know, we got the bug and we decided that uh, we, would, we would try to grow chestnuts and uh, we've made a lot of mistakes. There wasn't a lot of information around in the 80s that was the right information for establishing an orchard 
And now we have a lot better information. And I'm going to put a plug in right now for Michigan State University. If it wasn't for Michigan State University and their agricultural uh, department there, um, I personally would not be uh, growing chestnuts. Uh, they helped us focus and learn. And actually, one of the one of the people that I hold in high esteem, he passed away about a year ago. His, his name was Dr. Dennis Fulbright, mm -hmm. and uh, he um, went all over the world to see how chestnuts. He went to China. Obviously, China is the biggest producer of chestnuts in the world. Um, probably the second and third areas of the, of the world is uh, Turkey and actually Korea have a, a large production of, of chestnuts. And I'm gonna go right back to Turkey, also has 11 chestnut candy factories uh, that make various candies um, and are sold all over the world. I mean, go online and look up Turkey or look up chestnuts in Turkey. And there's some very unique products out there that are candy, chestnuts. So it's, um, you can do a lot of things with chestnuts. <laughs> make different things other than just roasting chestnuts on an open fire. Yeah, in many respects, I've read somewhere that there's an estimate that Americans consume less than two ounces of chestnut a person or per year. And I was surprised, frankly, it was that high. <laughs> well, I, I would be surprised too. I'm One of my goals as a chestnut grower representing the co-op for the uh, in Michigan, which is called Chestnut Growers Inc., is to educate as many Americans that I can about chestnuts. It's easy when I find Europeans or Asian ethnic groups uh, to sell chestnuts. They know what chestnuts are all about, but the typical, like me, American consumer walking down the road, going down the road and then we see a stand with somebody roasting chestnuts and um, they've never had a chestnut. They don't know what it is they think. And they think they're, it's gonna taste like a nut when they bite into a roasted chestnut and it's totally different. Frankly, until tonight, I've never really thought of chestnut as a fruit. <laughs> so, so. Uh, it has attributes more like a fruit, yes. That's fascinating. Yes. So, so you're president of the Chestnut Cooperative and please, you know, please tell us what is uh, CGI, uh, the Chestnut Growers Inc., what does it do? Um, and why do farmers choose a cooperative? Okay, real quick, about 20 years ago, we had enough growers in the state. We didn't have much production. I'm gonna tell you that right now. We didn't, in fact, I think in 2001, uh, as a group of growers, maybe we had like 2000 pounds. And this is kind of weird, you, um, I think. This is a corporation. It's a, it's, it's Chestnut Growers Inc. is a, under the Michigan, Michigan state law. We're a, a, a co-op corporation um, where we, uh, we, we got together in, in 2001 and formed the steering committee. And in 2002, we formed the co-op at that time. Um, and we had probably over 40 growers at that time. We now today have 33 growers. We operate like a company. We have a board of directors. We have subcommittees. Uh, to do things, and we, our our goal as a cooperative is to we were to form a, a processing operation where there's a lot of chestnut growers across the United States, but they kind of do everything. They clean their chestnuts, well, they harvest their chestnuts, clean their chestnuts, um, uh, size their chestnuts, then bag their chestnuts for the market, and then do their own selling. The cooperative that we formed is a marketing cooperative. So what we're doing is we're doing things that would that don't have to be duplicated at the farm level. We accept the chestnuts, we clean the chestnuts, we um, uh, we run the chestnuts through a, a float tank because the floaters will float up, and those are kind of suspect chestnuts that may have problems, but most of the chestnuts sink to the bottom of the float tank goes into a sizer. We use a carrying sizer at this point. We're gonna probably evolve into a barrel sizer eventually, but the carrying sizer does a lot of, a lot of good work for us as far as sizing goes. And we, we make six different sizes of chestnuts or size six different sizes. And we sell 
at different prices. The larger chestnuts bring a higher premium. The smaller chestnuts um, usually are a lower cost, but all of our chestnuts that we sell, we're making a profit with throughout the organization. But what it allows us to do is to go to the marketplace and have, let's say, 100,000 to 200,000 pounds of chestnuts, and we can uh, negotiate pricing with larger entities like Whole Foods, uh, Meyer stores here in the, in the Midwest, um, in some of the larger stores um, in, in the vicinity. And we also work with uh, a couple of different uh, distributors where we go like, like a terminal, a produce terminal, you know, Detroit produce terminal. And we can go in there and, and deal with the bro kind of a broker there and them buying the chestnuts and then uh, distributing the chestnuts all over, all over the state of Michigan. Uh, we also are in Chicago with a couple of different uh, brokers there that we work with. And uh, it allows us to, to be able to, we're not limited where, you know, maybe we'll, you know, we're not like a single grower with maybe we only have like 5,000 pounds or maybe 10,000 pounds of chestnuts. We're talking thousands of pounds that we can um, maneuver in the, in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is with Chestnut Growers Inc., we also rent a facility, which is actually tied with Michigan State University, but we have refrigeration units where we can keep the chestnuts at 32 degrees. That allows us to have better quality chestnuts for the marketplace to, to uh, sell. And since chestnuts are 50% water, they dehydrate at room temperature. You ever, you go into the marketplace and you look for fresh chestnuts and you see them with the peanuts and the, and the walnuts and the pecans and go up and squeeze them. And you'll find that there's usually airspace between the, the actual meat of the chestnut and the, and, the, and the shell. That means that it's dehydrating. In some cases, the chestnut becomes very hard. Um, and that's not good for the consumer. Then the consumer realizes, hey, these aren't, aren't, aren't so good. And you'll find Italian chestnuts come into the market and they're not stored properly either. And they take a little more time to get into the United States and they're prom probably 90% of the chestnuts that are sold in the United States are coming from um, Italy, maybe some of the other countries in Europe. And then uh, there is some that come in from uh, uh, China that come in. And uh, there is some that come in from Korea as well. Uh, but the primary source of chestnuts that come in this country are Italian. One thing that I'll tell you about CGI, in the markets that we're in now, it was hard in the beginning, in around 2008, when we started our production to increase, and we go to markets and they weren't sure about our chestnuts. They, they would go to a buyer and they'd take a chestnut out of the bag and I'd take one out and then they'd bite into it. And also people, you know, they look at, well, you're going to bite into that chestnut. They think it's really hard. It's not. A good chestnut is still soft that you can bite into it and see what it tastes like. Um, and many of you probably already know about that. But the, the um, we have replaced the Italian chestnuts. I have markets now that wait for our chestnuts to come in. And then they only buy Michigan grown chestnuts from our co-op. They... And then and if they run out before the end of December, they'll go and buy Italian chestnuts. But mm -hmm. they're, our chestnuts are better because we're able to control the temperature. The other aspect of what we do is, is uh, if you're a buyer, I only want to sell you enough that'll last for about two weeks in the marketplace to the consumer. Why is that? So we do just-in-time um, packaging. We keep the chestnuts in bulk in the in the, in the refrigeration area. And uh, when we get an order and I, and I've talked to a couple, I have one market that has two stores and they can sell about two, th each store sells about a thousand pounds a week. And originally they'd come in and they would say, Roger, we want, we want 20,000 pounds for the season. And the guy's name was Vinny. And I said, Vinny, no, I'm not going to sell you the 20,000 pounds for the season. What I'm going to do is when I'm going to sell you 2,000 pounds, and then in two in two weeks, let me know, and I'll deliver. You know, you can give me a heads heads up, and we'll deliver another 2,000 pounds, and we'll do it over a period of, you know, 10, 10 weeks, and uh, 
they have fresh chestnuts for the consumer, for the customer. And that's key to part of our success is keeping the chestnuts as fresh as possible to the consumer so that when they take it home and put it in their crisper for a while, um, it's not going to be um, a bad product later on. How does one get into um, a major supermarket um, to, to find the buyers? Is, uh, I don't, there's, there, we don't have yellow pages anymore. And it's not like, not like <laughs> these companies are, are wide open for smaller businesses. So how do you get into that? Well, one thing is I, I actually went down to the Detroit Produce Terminal yes. and there's different vendors, different buyers there. And I actually took several 25 pound bags and walked into the different uh, buyers offices and said, hey, we got, we got chestnuts, you like it? Well, a couple of them would say, hey, like I told you, they would take a chestnut out, excuse me, out of the bag right, and try the chestnut. And I would do the same thing. And they say, yeah, we'll, we'll try these. And then they put in an order. And then we built on that. Um, a couple of the other uh, buyers that I had, we have a food show or a, an egg show in December in Michigan here. And I would go to that. Um, it's, it's called the Great Lakes Expo yes. and many different, but well, they had like a buyer's night there and they'd have different like Whole Foods and, and Meyer. And I would take samples there and talk to the manager of the produce of that store. And they would take the product back and I'd have their card, their information. And then I'd follow up on it and make that contact. And now I, I don't have to do that anymore because they, they uh, know us, but you've got a relationship. Yeah. It's just, it's just going around to different stores and making your presence known. I've also been known to go into a market and talk to the produce guy and say, listen, I got, here's a 25 pound bag of chestnuts. It's a sample. Take this. If you like it, let me know. And we'll be glad to come back and support you. Do the retailers need guidance? Uh, you know, often we go to the smart market and we find these dried bits of brown <laughs> chestnuts that are sitting in uh, the potato with the potatoes, the onions. They're usually in a basket. Yes. Um, um, I think you're taking a completely different approach. I've talked to the, well, there's two things. One is I talked to the produce guy and if they want to put the chestnuts out on display in a bulk area, only put enough pounds that will handle the traffic for half a day or at the most for the day. And if you have anything left over, take it back into your refrigeration unit overnight and keep it there. Don't leave it out like you've done it, done it for years. Uh, with Meyer. We have one pound bags that we market to them. I've convinced them that they need to put those bags in an area with their with their vegetables, like um, uh, well cranberries one or carrots two, where they need to be chilled and they need to you know they'll, they'll spray them with water too to keep them uh, misted. And uh, they 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 were convinced they they work it that way. And uh, uh, but. On occasion, I've gone into a store to check and I will, if they're doing it right, I tell them. And if they're doing it wrong, I suggest that you're going to have a problem with your chestnuts. They're going to dry out. They're just, uh, it's, it's just, a, it's just because they're, they're 50% water and they dehydrate. <clears throat> and we care. Um, yeah. I just want to ask about the cooperative. Is there, um, you've got chestnuts coming in and you process them then you package them uh, and then you market them. Is there a range, how far away can a farm be from your processing operation? Can, is, do you have well, one for this whole state? Is it one for a county or how does that work? For right now, it's just one processing, which is in a location on the west side of the state, Yes, but um, about three quarters down from, from um, the lower peninsula, it's, it's down around Grand Rapids is where, our, if you know Michigan, yes. uh, that's where our processing operation is. And that's only because we can lease uh, uh, reasonably refrigeration that's available in the months of October, November, and December. The, the, uh, we plan on, we have a, a group of growers that are developing up in the Traverse City area, and that's towards the upper part of the lower peninsula. Yes. And we're looking at uh, having a satellite operation there. Um, 
where we could set up refrigeration and then then and the chestnuts would be weighed up there by the way just to back up every grower when they bring in their chestnuts they're all weighed and they're kept in separate bins and then when we process them size them um the the growers are paid on the size of their chestnuts as well so we keep them uh separated until we actually uh bag them up and bulk them and we use we have traceability throughout our whole process so we know if the chestnuts came from my orchard um, and went to let's say uh, Vincent Joe's at the at the market from the invoice we code under the invoice number we know which grower each grower has a has a uh, ID and we're able to track so if we have a problem with any of our chestnuts we can track it right back to the orchard that it came from in our process all part, all part of quality control process right right but yeah so far we haven't we don't have an, another satellite basically just about any any location where you grow chestnuts you can get to our operation within less than two hours okay what about <coughs> what about the other side um in terms of of sales to uh consumers or your distributors or to markets how, how far away is it a one day tr you know truck uh, drive is is are there limits of how far away you can sell your chestnuts? No, there's really not. I mean, within a within a, a day, um, we can get anywhere in 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 the in the state of Michigan. In a day, we can get to Chicago. Um, in a day, we can get to. Uh, we have a. I have one buyer that's in Rhode Island, and uh, he really likes our chestnuts. So we uh, we can connect with him. Sometimes we use a depending on the weather condition that we we'll use refrigerated trucks to move the chestnuts. Uh, sometimes if the weather conditions are okay, we can probably move the chestnuts uh, safely in, in a, in a regular uh, truck. Okay. But, but we've, you know, and we've marked, well, okay. We've, I've actually personally driven chestnuts to New York city in a straight truck to get it to a market there in, in, uh, in, uh, uh, I want to say, in, in Flushing, in Flushing, New York, it was kind of cool. Oh, must have been very expensive, exp expensive chestnuts, given the fact that it's in New York. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, is there, is there, I, I've, I've read that, uh, for, for instance, in Korea, they consume about four pounds uh, a person a year. Right, right. Uh, in Europe, it's about two pounds uh, in, in certain parts of Europe. Um, is there an ethnic aspect of this? Um, or, or certain, you know, there are, we have we have ethnic pop, pop, populations here in across America, and I'm curious whether they're buying your products. Uh, well, actually, it's it's uh, very prevalent uh, with our markets that uh, we have a Bosnian population in uh, Grand Rapids, and uh, they buy uh, a lot of chestnuts. We have, um, I have different Asian markets uh, in the Detroit metropolitan area and they buy our chestnuts. Um, a lot of, and then, and then uh, I have a, a European markets and I have Eastern Mediterranean markets that are consuming our chestnuts a lot. Um, and, and, and that's where, that's where, it, you know, it's, there's that a level of, of um, consumer that um, has grown up around chestnuts and they're fascinated that we have chestnuts here in Michigan that taste so good. And there's that larger population, uh, which will lead into, I think Jim's trying to take me down this road, but I'm gonna tell you right now, the, the demand is much, much greater than the supply. And the other piece of this is, is that there's a large population here in the United States that they don't know that they need chestnuts. And it's as a chestnut grower, and I'm sure many of you are in the audience here, um, our goal is to teach people about chestnuts. And I'm, I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna tell you a real quick story. One of the people that bought chestnuts from us this year, he only bought 25 pounds, but his wife, saw, and many of you may have your wives or whatever, see the Hallmark 
movies, the Christmas movies and stuff. And there's several now that have roasting chestnuts. And this particular um, uh, gentleman is in Virginia. And he called me up, he saw our website, called me up and he says, uh, he says, I, I, I've never roasted chestnuts, but I need 25 pounds for a big event, uh, December the 4th or something like that. Some, it's actually December the 5th. And we're gonna roast chestnuts. And uh, it's, a, it's a, an event where other food things are done there too in, in Virginia, or not in Virginia, no, it was in Mar I'm sorry, it was in Maryland, Maryland, Fredericks, Fred, Frederick, Fredericks. Fredericksburg. Fred, yeah, Maryland. Anyways, he, uh, he, uh, but he was out, he says, my wife saw this on, on uh, Hallmark and really excited about roasting chestnuts. So I, I basically was teaching him on the phone how to, how to do this. And uh, he called me up afterwards and he says, you know, Roger, this really worked good. Thank you very much for telling us how to roast chestnuts. And, uh, and he's an American consumer. I mean, they, you know, they, I'm sure they're going to buy chestnuts from us again. And oh, oh, every, every year, um, there's a, um, you may, some of you may know this in Michigan, but we, there's a, a Greenfield village. Um, it's called the Henry Ford, but they, they have, uh, all these different houses from different centuries and a big, big park area and people come and visit and they decorate it in, during Christmas time. Anyways, we provide them 3000 pounds of chestnuts to roast every year, uh, for their event. And, uh, we've worked with them on how to score them and roast them and all that good stuff. So, uh, there's a market there, but we're educating people that, Hey, chestnuts are out there and roasted chestnuts are good. <laughs> Excellent. Um, Hey, I need to ask how, about in a good year, how many pounds would the co-op process? Okay. So far our, our two oh. biggest years was, um, in 2016 where we had almost 240,000 pounds. And then two years later in 2018, we had over 220,000 pounds. Um, that was a big learning curve in 2016 because we were talking to our growers, communicating, and we estimated that, you know, that year maybe we were gonna have like 100 and, 150 maybe thousand. And uh, we were we were blindsided because um, at, at the end of, uh, October, well, the first week of November, we knew we had 240,000 pounds to move. And uh, that's been my longest selling season. We started selling, usually we start about the last week of October selling, and we didn't finish selling until uh, mid-February uh, that year. And uh, we had to sell some chestnuts for a, a, a lower price, and obviously in January and February, we we're really hustling. 2018, take us. We learned. We learned some things, and uh, we set up our operation, made it more efficient, and we received 220,000, which we anticip we anticipated close to 200,000, and we sold those. We started selling the last week of October, and we were done. Um, December 22nd of that year, we come, we're all sold out. And I'm, I'm good, I must, must, I must mention that in the market, we kind of thought, well, there'd be a market from the beginning of November to Thanksgiving, through Thanksgiving. But we weren't sure about the market after Thanksgiving going into the end of December. And there's a market there, my friends. There's definitely a market, and uh, we 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 can if we have it, if we have the volume, we can we can sell. Um, right now, I'm if I have a hundred thousand pounds, we're we're done, we're done before Thanksgiving, unfortunately. Uh, but if we have more than more than a hundred thousand, uh, we can take this uh, marketing all the way through December. Really? Yeah, because I see on your site, you're, you're sold out. Yes. Yes. Um, I mean, just for a basis of comparison, the United States is, is importing over 20 million dollars, dollars of yeah. chestnuts each year. Right. Wow. So there's, there's quite a bit of room in terms of competing with the imported 
nuts. Yeah, and I, I just want to emphasize that we as growers here in the United States, locally, locally grown is a big deal. And if you can control the temperature and the quality of the chestnuts, you're going to do quite well. Are your chestnuts a branded? Well, Chestnut Growers Inc. is a brand, CGI a brand. We're okay. trademark CGI. Okay. All right. Just curious. Yep. I've read that health benefits are, are, are part of a driving force in the global uh, chestnut area. Do people take that into consideration here? Well, number, number one, there's a uh, gluten-free is a big deal. Chestnuts are gluten-free, obviously. Um, it's not a wheat product, it's, a, you know, chestnuts. And uh, it's got the, the, it's got protein in it. That's why you could live on it. You and I, Jim, we could live on chestnuts. We may not like it, you know, to stay on it, just have a diet of chestnuts, but chestnuts have protein, vitamin A, vitamin C, vitamin E, and a couple other vitamins in there. And, and it's just, and it's low in fat. It's the right kind of fat for you. And uh, it's just a, a, a unique food in itself. Got it. <clears throat> Tell me what kind of farmers um, grow ch chestnuts? What kind of farmers are in your, your co-op? I mean, are they chestnut enthusiasts? Are they uh, professional commercial farmers, really full time? Are they retirees? What, what kind of, what is your population made up of? Actually, it's a little bit of all those. Uh, we have a, a, actually a, a, a couple of major farmers uh, that do, they have apples. One, one has an apple, major apple orchard, grows uh, Honeycrisp, markets a lot of his stuff in the Chicago markets. Um, but he also has about 20, 20 acres of, 20 to 25 acres of chestnuts. Um, another farmer, um, who has like nine acres of chestnuts. He also, uh, farms, uh, corn, um, big, uh, asparagus grower and, uh, does some other, other crops on the side, but, uh, his, his chestnut business has, has, uh, provided him, his orchard is now about 20 years old. And it has provided him a good income right now at being 20 years uh, old. So it, it's, it's, it, it does, it, it can be, but, um, and then there's some that are what you call, um, um, I, guess, I guess I can describe myself. I'm not a full-time farmer. I have a, I have um, 53 acres of which I have eight acres that are planted with chestnut trees. And about eight of those eight, or seven of those acres consist of 20 year old trees right now. Um, I, repl I planted new trees about five years ago. And then I'm in the process of planting about 200 trees in, an, in another, well, adjacent to the sections where I have chestnuts in, in that property. I used to have Christmas trees too as an income. So I, I had four acres of Christmas trees, Fraser firs that. Um, were when we finalized, we harvest about every five, when they, they were about uh, 10 years old, 10 years old, nine years old, we were harvesting them um, at that point, not all, all at once. So we had good income coming from that uh, Christmas tree orchard for about five years. So, the, if I had, so I'm sorry, Roger, go ahead. It, no, anyways, but then there is, and then there's others that just have land available and uh, they're just doing the chestnuts um, on their own, but they're each, every grower is kind of has a different aspect, but not, not as many that are full-time farmers as the couple that I mentioned already. Okay. So if I'm a landowner and I was interested in setting up a chestnut part of the property for chestnuts, what would do you think the minimum would be the minimum number of acre, acres that I, that would make, even begin to make sense? Well, I mean, you could do as little as one acre, but I think from my perspective, about five acres would make sense. The other thing is if you have property, you gotta be careful. Um, you wanna test the uh, pH 
Um, chestnut trees like low pH, like five, between five and, and six yes. pH. And uh, you wanna look at what's growing around you. Um, in my area where I grow chestnuts, there's a lot of blueberry farms in my neighborhood. Now, the blueberries can take you know pH down to four and do well, but you don't want the pH to be that low, but uh, you want acidic soil for chestnuts. So, you know, where, where, where pear, where uh, peach trees grow well, chestnut trees should grow well. You're looking for sandy loam. Um, I've actually had the experience of our first farm that we had uh, when we started growing, working on chestnuts back in uh, 1990, uh, we had a, a piece of land that was heavy clay and it wasn't, um, we needed to make it more acidic. The pH was actually closer to seven. Right. And we had a hard time growing chestnuts. And I was, you know, I was a novice. I didn't know what the heck I was doing. And uh, we took a 25 acre plot out of a hundred acre uh, farm and uh, attempted to grow chestnuts. And uh, it didn't prosper at all. And uh, at the end, we, had, we said, we're going to sell this and go to a piece of property that makes more sense. So location is is important aspect. I mean, even if you if you went to an area where you saw some chestnut trees that were growing well, that's a good location to grow chestnuts too. I mean, it's just location. What what grows there now is going to help you a lot and determine what's going to grow when you plant something. Okay, so let me ask uh, let me ask you about the Chestnut Growers of America. Uh, okay, tell me about that organization and what what are you trying to do there? Okay, it used to be called Western Growers. <laughs> of America, <laughs> and uh, it the name changed uh, probably about 10, 15 years ago. It's a nonprofit organization. It's if you're a chestnut grower, uh, this is an organization for you to join. It represents you get to interact with individuals that are growing chestnut orchards all over the United States, and uh, actually. Um, I was surprised to realize how many different locations we have that are growing chestnuts. Um, there's a substantial orchard in Delaware um, that uh, has done well. I don't, unfortunately, the people that used to own it um, sold it. And I don't know how that orchard is doing, but it was a, it was a good orchard. But uh, there's orchards in Florida. Um, there's orchards in, you know, in Missouri, uh, Iowa. <clears throat> Illinois, they're just, I, it's hard for me to name a state that doesn't have uh, some chestnuts growing there. But um, uh, anyways, the, uh, it's, a, it's a nonprofit and it's an educational group where we, we have a board of directors for that too, but, uh, but and they're, each one of the board of directors is chosen, we kind of have uh, representatives from all over the United States and every year we try to have an annual meeting in some uh, different location. We don't do it the same place every year. We go to a different location. Like we were supposed to do it this last year in Pennsylvania at Penn State. Uh, that didn't happen, but we're looking at planning to have our meeting at Penn State in 2022. We usually do it at the beginning of June. The, uh, we've had meetings out in California, uh, out in, in uh Actually, we were close to where uh, it's in uh, Grigley, California, and that was not too far from Paradise, which had the fire that eliminated that 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 town and they're rebuilding now. Uh, we've had meetings up in Washington State and Oregon. Um, we have uh, meetings in Missouri. Uh, well, anyways, we try to go to a different location so that in that location, we usually get more growers coming to the meeting from that particular area and we get to interact with those those growers and you learn you learn from seeing um, what other growers are doing how they're managing their orchard how they process their chestnuts and what kind of products they're doing with the chestnuts got it okay and <coughs> I, just, I just have to ask before the break and I meant to ask this earlier and I apologize uh, to the audience but what what your the chestnuts you're selling are they are they Asian are they European? Are they okay, we do we do actually we do both. 
we have um, they're, they're European slash Japanese hybrids, primarily. We are planning some French cultivars in different places in the state of Michigan now. So we're gonna have a variety there, but those, those I would call Euros, they're all European. We also have a group of growers that are, have done Chinese. For instance, if you have a Dunstan orchard, that would be Chinese. We have uh, some other orchards that have grown Chinese cultivars. Some of the name cultivars like uh, Sleeping Giant or Peach or Quinn, something like that. Uh, Greg Miller has a lot of varieties of Chinese. And I have different buyers that request and say, hey, Roger, we'd like Chinese. We got 80% of our crop is Chinese. Okay, very, very helpful. Thank you. I'm sorry, 20%, 20%. is Chinese and 80% is Euro. Okay, yep. that's very, very helpful. Thank you. Okay. Well, let's let's take a break and then take some questions. And the audience is uh, is uh, generously giving us questions. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, if any of our listeners would like to join us at the American Chestnut Foundation, go to www.acf.org and click on the membership tab. Members receive our monthly newsletter, TACF's Chestnut Magazine, invitations to our spring growers and fall meetings volunteer opportunities, and have access to chestnut seeds, weather and growing conditions permitting. Uh, plus you get to meet people who are really pursuing something larger than themselves and that will span several generations. Uh, this year our, our chapters thrown in an additional incentive. Any new members who join the Pennsylvania, New Jersey chapter in January will be entered in a drawing to win six pints of ice cream of your choice from the beloved Penn State Berkey Creamery. Creamery is located about two minutes from our headquarters office at Penn State. And Roger, <clears throat> when you're at Penn State, I, we, will, uh, we will reconnect there and, okay. um, for your annual meeting. And 10 right. minutes, it's 10 minutes from our chestnut orchard. And when, cool. people, okay. when people visit with us, usually they find their way over to the creamery. So okay. let's, get to, let's get to the questions um, and let me just take a look. So uh, John says, great information, uh, and you may have covered this. How many, I'm going to, this is going to be a little rapid fire question. How many farmers are part of your co-op? 33. 33. Okay. What's the size range of the orchards? Uh, probably anywhere from uh, three to four acres all the way up to 65 acres. Okay. Uh, what's this, what's the, what kind of prices are the growers receiving? When we do the, um, the grow, they're getting somewhere between, um, well, close to 250 per pound. Okay. Uh, are they making a significant <clears throat> part of their income from chestnuts? Some are, some aren't. It's really dependent upon the size of your orchard and number of, of pounds. One grower that we had this year, had over 40,000 pounds <coughs> and uh, that could be a significant amount of income for him. But the other problem is we're running into this problem right now where we have alternate bearing issues where one year his orchard and my, my orchard too are doing an alternate bearing process. So we're trying to work on solving that. Got it. Okay. <laughs> Um, how many years would you expect it would take for a tree planted to be, to be productive? Uh, they start being productive at around six years. And these are grafted trees, um, not a seedling. A seedling will take much more time. Usually at about 10 years, it seems that production starts to really kick in. Okay. Um, how much... After that and used to grow, yes. Okay. How much of your produ product is sold online? Uh, this year we sold 15, I wanna say, well, probably about 10% right now online. Okay. And actually I'm, I'm referencing, <laughs> I'm referencing revenue. So I might be wrong about that. It might be a little bit less than 10%, more like, more like 8%. All right, that's helpful. 
Uh, yeah. This year, the year that your crop, ex, you know, far exceeded your estimates, what kind of changes did you make to react to it? Um, we, we, in, we, da, 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 da. we initiated um, a change in our line. We have a line as far as a, 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 a cleaning, what, a, we have a line where we receive the chestnuts and then we clean. We put in a new uh, piece of equipment. It's, I call it a car wash, but it's a, a high powered spray uh, that sprays from the bottom and the top of a conveyor belt where the chestnuts go across. And before that, we set in, we got a new blower that blows all the debris from the chestnuts. Like usually we get some burrs and stuff like that. So that would be cleared off. Then we uh, uh, did that uh, power wash on the chestnuts and that made a lot of difference. And then uh, we reconfigured the, uh, uh, the, the, the sizing machine for the, for the size of the nuts. And then we, we also uh, purchased individual scales. We have six scales where the bins sit, where the size of the chestnuts flow into each one of the bins so that we can get readings on the individual chestnuts. So we cut, we cut out some things that would cost us time and now we have the ability to process about 4,000 pounds per hour in our processing, which makes a lot of difference. And then okay. the, okay, and then the other, I'm just gonna add this one piece. The other part is having the buyers ready to uh, buy the chestnuts. I had to scout for new buyers in order to make, to, to sell where we needed to sell. And that, that I've solved that problem too. We've got the buyers out there and I don't, I kind of, each year now, I don't, I only give you, if you're a regular customer, I only sell a piece of the pie that you normally would get. Now, if we have a bigger pie, then you get a bigger piece. So that, that uh, I've learned that too. I can't just sell to one customer. It'd be dependent on just one customer. Okay, Diverse, diversification. Yes, yes. Uh, you have to hedge. Um, Donna, Donna asks kind of an interesting question. I don't know. I, I picked in Lapeer. Do you know where Lapeer is? Yep. Yes, I do. Okay. I know the grower, their main grower there, Ivory. Pete Ivory has a farm there. Okay. So she picked in uh, Lapeer this fall. Quite an experience. An ethnic family of Eastern descent was there collecting hulls to take home as well as the nuts. So she I guess must been, she must have been at Ivory's, Ivory's farms. Mm -hmm. And she said, when asked, when asked, she said, for tea, do you know what kind, what type of tea and its use? Is there, is this a viable market? Thank you. Uh, I'd have to say, I don't know. I do have a, a packet of chestnut tea um, in my cupboard here. I have not tried it. Um, I guess, I don't know. I don't know what it tastes like, uh, but yeah, that's a unique thing. I don't know. What we have talked about the burrs and what to do with them. Typically, I grind them up in my orchard, and they become the kind of a nitrogen help nit nitri nit nitrogen enrich the soil um, in my orchard. And uh, I guess we'd have to look a little bit further into that idea, Donna. Thank you. Um, another another person asked: Does your co-op sell chestnuts for seed for others who want to grow them? Are there varieties that are adapted to colder climates? Um, no. Well, to answer your question, no, uh, we don't sell seeds. Um, as a grower and as an experienced uh, person in this industry, I we do a lot of work with Forest Keeling, and we have provided seeds to Forest Keeling, and they graft trees to what we want as growers in our, in the state of Michigan. So, um, and they have a, a patented root process that they do and they make, they ensure their trees are quality trees to sell to the grower. Um, at the same time, uh, we're working with Michigan state on, uh, uh, with tissue culture and, and growing a, uh, a perfect clone, so to speak, but, but, uh, Similar to the ideas about hazelnuts in in uh, tissue culture growing and rooted, we are working on rooted cuttings too. So those are some other aspects of 
we're working on, but no, the co-op is not uh, doing the um, marketing of, of seeds. Although I, I would assume that some of the some of the growers may know each other and may be exchanging things, but yeah, yeah, and that well, that's the other problem is it would require us to 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 uh, <laughs> divide up this. I mean, when I say euro, I know that they're euro, but I don't know uh, necessarily from the nuts, which in some I have one 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 gentleman who's a researcher at MSU. He can look at the chestnut and tell me which cultivar it is. Okay. Wow. Um, but but uh, that's not easy to do. So for us to, you know, if, if you came to me and you wanted uh, Prakosh Magul or you want Bush the Betazak as a seed, um, that would be that would be something different that we would have to work on in order to make sure we had those seeds. Okay. So we haven't really worked in that market. Got it. How far north in Michigan are chestnuts grown? Typically, uh, the Lower Peninsula, up in, up in uh, uh, there's up in the northern part, there's Eastport, um, north of Traverse City, the, uh, even Petoskey has some chestnut uh, orchards there. Rogers City on the east side there has, actually, that looks like it's going to work out pretty good, that chestnut orchard there. Uh, here again, again, it's a, the one in Rogers City is a unique area. It's got elevation. It's got, there's people that are, there's some apple orchards in that area. And we have a family that's growing a, a chestnut orchard as well there. Wow, it's cold, really cold up there. I'll, I'll tell you where chestnuts don't thrive as well is the middle of the state. If you look at, um, that we get the Lake Michigan is like an ocean effect. Like if you lived on the West Coast in, in uh, um, California or Washington or Oregon, we have that effect. In fact, my orchard is two miles inland from Lake Michigan and it gets a lake effect. I get snow. I also get rain when, when, when I need it, whereas the clouds and that will dissipate when they get beyond my orchard and there's no rain going east. So um, there is an advantage and there's a lot of orchards that are located on the west side of the state of Michigan along the Lake Michigan uh, coastal area. Roger, I have two more areas. Um, okay. Well, I, I can not one or two questions are coming in, but I have to ask. So, is there, when I was, when I've been in Europe, I've noticed uh, a lot of different chestnut products. Um, you, we had talked, we had talked about chestnut liqueur uh, I, I've seen there. Are you experimenting with other types of products for, uh, from chestnut? Is that something that the co op is doing? Um, it's not the call. Well, okay, we we uh, actually we created a different company with um, uh, growers um, involvement from CGI <coughs> to an extent. Um, it's called Treeborn Inc. And out of Treeborn Inc., we grow, we we make different chestnut products that are unique. Um, we have a, a product called Chestnut Chips. We do both roasted and regular. Uh, we make chestnut flour, both regular and roasted. Um, we, uh, the roasted chestnut chips go to breweries. And in the beginning, there's a, 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 a beer that's called uh, Chestnut Head. And that's uh, made with Michigan maple syrup and uh, Michigan grown chestnuts from the chip product. And uh, it's, a, it's a port beer. And it's also aged in bourbon barrels. And it's a unique um, beer that, and the name of the brewery is called Roke here in Michigan. Um, we have another, anyways, a lot, of, a lot of the breweries we've sold chips to to make different chestnut beers. I have one brewery that makes four different chestnut beers. And right now I'm working with a brewery up in Canada called Glutenberg. And the unique thing about chestnuts is that the ingredient chestnut chips is obviously gluten-free gluten and they only make gluten-free beers. Oh. So they don't put the weight, the wheat in it. And right. that's, you get, you know, so it's a unique product. So we've worked on that. It's kind of a unique thing. It's a hard, um, these products are expensive because it takes three pounds of fresh chestnuts to make one pound of flour, one pound of chips, um, 
once again, we're taking the moisture out of the, out of the chestnut. So um, that's a unique product, but, but we make frozen peel too. There's a market for frozen peeled chestnuts. Yeah. Okay, excellent. That uh, Reborn has, and we, we have a, an Italian made peeling machine uh, that's probably the only uh, major chestnut peeling machine in the United States here located in Jackson, Michigan. So that allows us to do some unique things. Okay. A uh, couple more questions. Do you prune, uh, Ron asked, do you prune to stimulate production? Yes, yes, yes. We, are, we also prune the, yeah, we need to open the orchard. The, the trees uh, will actually, well, the, my original trees are 20 by 20. They start to fill in and then pretty soon I got to take out a tree, take out every other tree because really these trees will grow out to be 35 feet high and 35 feet wide. So in order to stimulate growth, you need to open up, you'll get more production if you open up the area of the tree so it, it uh, will produce more. Uh, some of these trees could produce upwards of 200 to 250 pounds per tree eventually <clears throat> as they grow out. So they need to, yes, you need to prune a lot. That's one thing I've learned. I've done more pruning in the last few years, more taking wood out of the orchard and having to either chip it or burn it one way or another. And it's, uh, the work doesn't go away. There's always something to do with the orchard. Uh, John asks, uh, you mentioned al alternate uh, bearing, the alternate bearing problem. Do yeah. different cultivars sync up on this? We're not sure yet. We're, we're working with MSU on that uh, uh, problem. Um, we do think that we need to do more, um, more extreme pruning than we've done in the past, in particular with my orchard and the orchard that's about 30 miles north of me, um, we need to do we need to do ex extreme pruning, and then uh, and then come back and and see what happens here. I don't have enough information to tell you which method is best or not. We know that the apples do a spray to cut down the production, but boy, if these trees have a, an opportunity to really send out a lot of energy, they will but then they got to take a break if they send out energy. We had, and, and well, we had a couple of these orchards, which one was mine. We had six to 7,000 pounds of chestnuts per acre in our harvest. And that's unheard of in, in chestnut orchards that I'm aware of anywhere in the United States. I've not, usually you talk about 3,000 pounds, maybe 4,000 pounds per acre, but not, not six and 7,000 pounds per acre. It's unbelievable. But when they throw out that kind of energy, um, they'll, the trees, they'll take a break for a year, unfortunately. Roger, uh, last question. Do you have any advice for us in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, for someone? Do you have any advice for us in terms of, of us expanding our chestnut farming industry? I... I think if you've got a few growers and you want to form a co-op, I think that's a way to do it where, where you've got, you know, if you've got support within, um, I think your educational arm could uh, do well to get people excited about planting um, trees in the right location and looking at, you know, developing a, a one acre, five acre, I think five or 10 acres would be a good orchard for for one person to work with. Once you get bigger, the gentleman I know that has 65 acres, that's oh that's 5,000 5, trees. There's going to be a lot of work there, but he's put in a lot of money. Um, he put an eight foot fence or no 10 foot fence around the entire property. And uh, it's going to be a big, it's probably going to be the biggest producer in, in Michigan, but it's, it's uh, a lot of money to put in there um, on average of five or 10 acre uh, project would be good to make, make, you know, somebody mentioned about income thinking back, I think, you know, if you have like 20 acres, you could make a nice, nice, uh, uh, nice yearly uh, salary over time. I mean, you could, you could, you could make a, make a, you could have a good livelihood with 20 acres of chestnut trees doing it right. But that's where we're at. Okay. Well, we like good livelihoods. Okay. Roger, 
Roger, thank you so much for sharing your insight. I know I'm looking at some of the comments and people are very appreciative of, uh, of all that you've shared tonight. Thank you so much for your time and, and uh, generosity. Thank you. And I, I'm, a, I'm available if you need me again. Okay, great. Okay. Um, we have one more session this week. Tomorrow at noon, we will wrap up our series with Lake Grabowski uh, discussing finding American chestnuts in the wild. Um, any of you who hike or roam the, roam, roam the woodlands may be in for a surprise one day and Lake will open up, maybe open you up to some new possibilities and tell you what to do if, we, if you find one. On behalf of the Pennsylvania, New Jersey chapter of the American Chestnut Foundation, we thank you for all your support this week. Uh, more information on our, our chapter is at www.panjtacf.org. And we hope you will consider joining with us to save and restore the American chestnut. Thank you and good night.